for Dr. Lampert and Dr. Mani. And we got to hear from Dr. Mani and his uh, amazing career. And this is our uh, privilege and an honor to uh, welcome Dr. Lampert uh, for the Berner Professorship and to you know, share with us, especially those who are early in our career, the, you know, the, the uh, path it takes and the commitment to specific areas of expertise and how you develop them over time. Uh, so Dr. Lampert uh, did her MD at Vanderbilt University uh, with a residency uh, at uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York, and then did her fellowship and uh, electrophysiology fellowship at Yale and Human Hospital. So, so she's an alumnus of this institution. And uh, so she's built a career on, uh, in, as an electrophysiologist and specifically as a sports cardiologist, looking at how athletes and their hearts respond and what are the challenges uh, in arrhythmias and other disorders they experience, which put them at risk for uh, certain cardiac death and other disorders, and how do healthy uh, athletes, uh, how their, their hearts respond uh, to exercise as well. So I'm gonna defer, I'm gonna uh, take this moment to welcome Dr. Lampert here to share her science with us, uh, and thanks for joining us. All right. Click on this. Okay. All right, great. That's what I was talking about. All right, so we had it. And it was working, and that's not. All right, I think you may have to use the. Um, use that? Yeah, okay. Anything on. is fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, so is that working better? So, my interest in athletes started with two patients that uh, I met very shortly after I became an attending. The first was a teenager. We were between pediatric electrophysiologists who presented with ventricular tachycardia and was seen to have a cardiomyopathy. Um, this young man um, played high school ice hockey. The second was a young, uh, was a young adult who was uh, also presented with ventricular tachycardia. Um, and this young man um, was in his 20s, but spent a good piece of his time uh, racing bicycles. So this was around the 19, late 1990s. And when uh, these two young men got defibrillators, and uh, at that time, after a patient was diagnosed with cardiac disease, uh, and you wanted to talk to them about whether they would be going back to whatever sport they played before, you looked up uh, their diagnosis uh, in a document that was called the Bethesda Conference Eligibility Recommendations for Competitive Athletes. And this, this document was basically an encyclopedia going from atrial septal defect to WPW, and you would look up the condition that your athlete had, and it would tell you, uh, yes, no, you're in, you're out. So for ICDs, it said athletes with conditions that result in cardiac arrest or ar ventricular arrhythmias um, generally are treated with an ICD and cannot participate in any moderate or high intensity competitive sports. However, athletes with ICDs with no episodes of ar arrhythmia for six months may engage in 1A competitive sports. So what are 1A competitive sports? Basically, sports are classified based on their static and dynamic components. So 1A are the least static and least, component, uh, least, uh, least uh, intense sports and include billiards, bowling, cricket, curling, golf, and riflery. Now, many of our elected officials are very happy to participate in 1A sports, but many of our patients want to do things that are more active. So I sat down, um, in particular, with the, with the young adult. And uh, I we went through the Bethesda guidelines. We went through the postulated risks. There could be an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmia, as the, the uh, authors hypothesized. We don't know whether the ICD can terminate ventricular arrhythmias during sports. A lot of things happen to your metabolism when you're, when you're uh, very active. Maybe there'd be a risk of injury due to syncopal arrhythmias or shock itself. Somebody has an arrhythmia, they get shocked, they fall, they fall on somebody else, everybody gets injured. Maybe there would be damage to the ICD system, the leads or the generator. So this young man said to me, well, that's all fine, but where's the data that any of this will actually happen? To which I had no answer at all. And he said, until you show me data, I'm gonna go back and keep doing my sports. And that's really what started me down, down this path. So before I start talking about that data, I just wanna spend a minute, why do we talk about restricting sports for athletes with cardiac disease at all? Well, first, sudden death in athletes is a heartbreaking phenomenon. Sudden death in anyone, any young person or any person is a heartbreaking phenomenon, but in athletes, this hits the news and often affects entire communities. This is a particularly sad example that, that was uh, written about in Sports Illustrated of a young man who uh, had a football scholarship and uh, to go, he had just graduated high school, had a football scholarship, and that summer had a cardiac arrest playing uh, basketball in the driveway uh, with, his, with his cousins. <laughs> 
So uh, while sudden death in athletes isn't common, it's not rare. Um, this is one of the uh, first uh, studies that looked at this was a, a registry set up by Dr. Barry Marin. And in this description, he describes 1866 sudden deaths occurring uh, in a 20 year period in athletes. Um, this is a, a, a more um, uh, this is a more rigorous study um, where uh, Harmon et al looked at deaths in the NCAA uh, over a four year period. Um, the Marin registry was just basically a voluntary registry of cases that people would send in. But this study had um, a denominator, 400,000 athletes per year, um, and a numerator of demographic data of uh, data maintained both by the NCAA. They also used parent heart watch database uh, and internet searches. And basically they found, so they were able to establish about 2 million athlete years, 273 deaths. Um, and so you get an incidence of sudden cardiac death in athletes of about 1 in 43,000. Now they looked at this data further, and they uh, looked at uh, and they found that the risk was higher in males, Division One athletes, Black athletes, basketball players. Um, the that I have some um, skepticism though about this analysis because there's a total of 36 medical deaths, 75 percent of which are cardiac. So we're looking at about 30 deaths, and we've got six variables here. So I think we have to take this number with a bit of a uh, grain of salt. But I do think this one in 43,000 is probably uh, reasonably accurate. So when sudden death happens, it happens during exercise. Um, this in, the, um, in one of the early reports from the Marin Registry, he describes that of the 134 athletes, 121 collapsed uh, during or after exercise. Well, maybe. When you think about the methods of the Marin Registry, this was a voluntary registry where people would send in a case, and pathologists sometimes would send in cases, and they would look in the media. And when an athlete goes down on the field, this is in the media. Sometimes it happens on TV. Everybody knows about it and you send it into the registry. On the other hand, an athlete dies in their sleep, you probably don't even realize they're an athlete. The pathologist doesn't even realize they're an athlete. Those people didn't get into the registry. Um, this is an example of a young man who played football. Uh, he was found on screening to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He was removed from the team. Later that year, he uh, got a job landscaping and had a cardiac arrest while he was landscaping. So this young man wouldn't have made it into that registry in any form. So the next hypothesis leading to these, or the next rationale leading to the restriction, well, if sudden death occurs more frequently during exercise, then restriction will be beneficial. Well, maybe, again, we know that in the general population, the paradox of exercise has been described. We know that while sudden death um, is more, we know that in general, exercise is good for you and improves mortality, but we also know that even in athletes, the immediate risk of dying increases during exercise. And this has been termed the paradox of exercise. It's really not a paradox, though. It's really just how the autonomic nervous system works. Uh, physical fitness uh, lowers your overall um, uh, sympathetic drive, increases your vagal tone, decreases mortality. In the, uh, in the acute situation, your, your uh, sympathetic drive increases, which is arrhythmogenic, but the net is that you die less if you are more active. And a great example of the paradox of exercise is Jim Fix, who, if you're as old as me, you might remember, he's the person who popularized jogging in the 1970s. And he died jogging at age 52. And the media just thought this was just the most ironic thing ever. But when you see Jim Fix's father died at uh, 43, 10 years before Jim Fix. And so Jim Fix, although he died jogging, probably got 10 years out of that. Um, so do we know, does this apply to a young person, an athlete who has different types of disease? And that's a question that we, did, we don't know yet. So um, let's go, uh, go on. So sudden death is more common in young athletes than non-athletes. Um, again, we have some data suggesting that. Um, this is data from Italy, um, where uh, this was the sudden death. That Italy is a place where you can acquire a lot of statistics because they both know who's participating in sports and they have a national health system, so they know who dies. And so uh, basically they uh, found that over this period of six years, deaths were higher in young athletes than they were in non-athletes. They instituted a screening program and they brought those deaths uh, down to, to equal. Um, but so before that screening program, it did look like deaths were probably more common in the, in the athletes. Um, this was a study um, by the Harmon Group, again, that looked at U.S. high schools. It was a prospective study, and over 4.1 million student years, there was 1.5 million student athlete years, and there was a higher rate of uh, death in the athletes. 
So what are these athletes dying from? Um, in the Marin registry of the 1866 sudden deaths, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was the most common reported uh, finding. Um, subsequent studies, however, have found uh, very different findings. Um, in the NCAA study, the most common uh, diagnosis was autopsy negative, sudden unexpected death, which is generally uh, assumed to be due to electrical disease that you can't diagnose after death. So, uh, and similarly, other uh, registries in the United Kingdom and the US military have more shown the NCAA findings. And this again is likely due to the uh, methodology of the Marin registry in which pathologists finding a normal heart might not have sent that case in. So um, basically, uh, in addition to sudden unexplained death, again, likely electric causes, we have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have coronary artery anomalies, um, and we have a small fraction due to myocarditis, and then uh, other causes. So how can we prevent sudden death in athletes? Um, very rarely, we have a warning sign. So occasionally, you see a, a patient will have syncope. This is a case that sort of popularized uh, thinking about athletes. Uh, Will Kimball was in the Wall Street Journal some years ago. He was a former uh, varsity collegiate basketball player who had a syncopal episode and was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and later went on to receive an ICD and, and play sports. Um, so syncope does, uh, in retrospective studies, has preceded a lot of um, uh, sudden cardiac death. On the other hand, syncope is very common in the young, and whether it actually is a harbinger or not is very hard to know. Um, syncope, when it occurs uh, during uh, exercise, has generally been felt to be pretty concerning. Um, this is a... Um, this is a study uh, from 2004 that uh, screened, that was a screening study. There were 7,000 athletes of whom six reported uh, syncope actually during exertion. And of those six, two were found to have uh, abnormal cardiac conditions. And this has entered the canon as like one in three syncope during exercise um, is, the, is the number to expect you're going to find something. Um, I did a, a literature search in 2021. This six-person series was quoted 18 times, um, but it's not a lot of data. As part of that literature, sir, oh, so we, we, were do, we did a study here ourselves where we looked to see of patients who present with exertional syncope, how many of them actually do have something. Um, we found um, overall there were 56 um, exertion-related symptoms. About most of them were near syncopes who didn't have anything. Um, of the, and many of them were after uh, exertion, but of, there were nine that actually had frank syncope during exertion. And of those, uh, just one uh, was actually found to have some, uh, and that person had an anomalous coronary, which got fixed. But we really didn't find that one in three. And when we did this literature search, actually no one else was finding one in three either. And for some reason, none of these other studies are ever quoted. Um, but the, when we put them together, the overall rate is we, was about 8%. So it's still a significant number. It still means you need to take very seriously someone who passes out in, uh, during exercise, um, but it's not that one in three uh, number. Um, so how can we, given that we don't have a lot of um, uh, warning signs, how can we prevent this from happening? So the American Heart Association recommends screening with history and physical um, as kids are starting to participate in sports, um, looking for personal and family uh, history uh, suggestions that they might be at risk. Um, the uh, many other countries, such as uh, Europe, um, recommend screening with an EKG, as does uh, the uh, International Olympic Committee um, requires EKGs, and most of the professional leagues require EKGs. And about half of NCAA schools um, do uh, EKGs. Um, this has been a debate that has been flourishing for years. Again, a lot more opinion than data. Um, should we or should we not be doing EKG screening? And I won't be spending a lot of time on that today. But just to say that we did start doing this in 2015. I um, had uh, given a talk on sports in 2017 and uh, had reported on uh, our screening. We've been doing it since here at Yale. Um, that uh, screening program has um, blossomed and become uh, Yale Sports Cardiology, which was um, defined or whatever as a program about a year ago. And really, we have a multidisciplinary group now of uh, individuals who bring their own expertise to the, to the study of athletes. And the, the purpose of the Yale Sports Cardiology program is to, um, it is to provide pre-participation screening to ours and other uh, schools. 
and also to provide consultation and care for athletes, uh, either with known cardiovascular disease or uh, with symptoms that are concerning for potential cardiovascular disease. And here are some of the uh, individuals participating in that program. So uh, we have uh, uh, um, uh, branched out to uh, screen several other schools. Um, and that has really been facilitated by a partnership with a local foundation called In a Heartbeat. We described uh, in a poster our uh, experience with In a Heartbeat. Um, basically, they're a, they're, it's just a, it's a young man who had a cardiac arrest and started a foundation. And uh, what he does is he goes to the schools and he uh, provides the equipment and he trains the trainers. He lends them the EKG equipment. It's, it comes um, over the, the internet to me. And I read it and then um, work together with uh, the team as needed to make any diagnoses, et cetera. So we branched out to several schools as well. So one way or another, whether through symptoms, through screening, um, through uh, frank cardiac arrest, um, an athlete may be diagnosed with cardiac disease. And this is where I really want to focus today. Now, what do we do? So in 2005, as we talked about, the approach was that athletes die of heart disease. They die of heart disease during sports. Therefore, athletes with heart disease should be restricted from sports. And we talked already about some of the fallacies that, uh, uh, in thinking that led to, this, to these types of recommendations. Further, these athletes, all of this data, uh, even if you believe it, is based on undiagnosed athletes. So what about the athlete that has been risk assessed, um, treated appropriately? Um, what data do we have? to balance safety and quality of life. So before we get to the safety, I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes on um, quality of life. We know there's a lot of downsides to athletic restriction. We know that um, sports uh, gives kids a lot of things we want them to have. They're less likely to be physically active kids, less likely to be obese, higher test scores, less risky behavior. They go on to do better in life and then they go on to have more active children themselves. Um, sports builds all the qualities that, you know, we want our kids to have. Um, we also know that um, restriction from sports impacts quality of life. This was a study um, of, uh, athlete, of college students, and it compared college students who were athletes to college students who were just your basic couch potato college students to those who had been restricted, not necessarily due to heart disease, just due to um, uh, orthopedic injuries. And they found that the uh, emotional and physical quality of life was higher in the athletes um, than the couch potatoes, but that those who had athletes who had been restricted had the lowest quality of life um, than, than the others. This was a small study that was a, a qualitative study of adolescents who had received ICDs, and they weren't really um, purposefully looking for sports. But that was something that they heard over and over again, that um, the, most Im the most impactful aspect of having an ICD for these kids was that they couldn't play sports. So here's a girl. I was younger. I was into sports. I was running around. I was bawling my eyes out um, when they said I couldn't play, and I hated the doctor. I was like, not normal. Kids could do stuff, and I couldn't do it. And here's the mom. You see her cry and say, my life is over, and I just wanted her to do what she enjoyed. Aside, and, you know, quality of life is in itself an important uh, endpoint, but even aside from quality of life, when you restrict a kid from sports, you know, we like to think they're all going to join the chess club, but probably that's not what's happening. And so uh, this was a great um, study. There was an, a small series in the New England Journal a couple years ago, and then a larger series in Heart Rhythm, um, where they uh, reported on uh, ventricular arrhythmia is occurring during video games mostly the war type games. Video games have all of the downsides of sports as far as the immediate um, sympathetic activation without all the benefits of the long-term sympathobagal balance. So uh, there's downsides to restriction. So to get back to, to my patient here. So he said to me, until you show me the data, I'm going back to my sports. And so this got me thinking, how are we gonna get some data for this guy one way or the other? So as a start, um, working with two uh, other cardiologists that were active in this field, David Canham, who was here years ago, and Brian Olshansky, um, we first started with a survey of members of the Heart Rhythm Society, which was actually NASB uh, at the time. And we just asked them uh, in a non-quantitative uh, way, have you ever had uh, uh, athletes in your practice who continued to practice? And uh, if so, uh, how did they do? Um, athletes in your practice who continue to do sports, and if so, how did they do? So of the respondents, which was pretty good for uh, two, 247 responded, um, many of them, 40% of them reported um, that uh, 
uh, they had received, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, and more than 40% of them reported that they had athletes who had been um, doing vigorous sports, um, many doing contact sports, competitive sports, sports with a risk of injury. Some of them, they had been shocked during sports, but um, there were very few, really no significant injuries or problems that had occurred. So this survey um, had all the biases of any survey, um, recall bias, et cetera, but it did tell us that athletes were out there participating with ICDs and that we could then do a prospective study, both practically speaking, since we, there were people doing this, and also ethically, since we would not be suggesting that people do things that were against the current guidelines. So we launched the um, Sports Safety Registry, and uh, the initial data came out in 2013, and then the longer-term data in 2017. And the purpose of this was a, it was basically a big series that was whose purpose was to determine the safety of sports participation. And we hypothesized that the incidence of serious adverse events um, defined as tachyrrhythmic death or external arrest or significant injury would be less than 1% over two years, and we had a number of uh, other uh, aims. So uh, we... Uh, uh, ultimately had 440 uh, individuals participating. Uh, a quarter of them were pediatric. The rest were young and middle-aged adults. Uh, Two-thirds were male. Um, ejection fractions were good, not surprising, because these were all people that were able to participate in sports. It was not a low-risk group. About half of the patients had the ICD for secondary prevention, so they had had a cardiac arrest or life-threatening arrhythmia. Cardiac diagnoses were similar to what you would see in uh, young people. Um, the highest number in this study had long QT followed by HCM. We had a lot of patients with ARVC, which we'll talk about a little later. We didn't tell people whether or not to what they should be doing. They just, if you were doing sports, you were in the study and then a variety of other conditions. Um, the sports participation, oh, 77 of them were highly competitive uh, interscholastic varsity type athletes. So they were young um, uh, high school or college players. And we found that the most common, and this is wrong, um, the most common overall were running, soccer, baseball. Um, in the elite uh, competitive athletes, it was actually um, baseball, basketball, and soccer were the most common sports. Um, this was a, a list of the uh, 20 patients that were actually in college, um, just describing more specifically what they had done. Um, the group was followed for 44 months, um, about four years each. There were 37 who didn't complete the study for various reasons. Um, but the results um, were uh, that we had no events. Basically, we had no tachyrrhythmic deaths, no arrests, no injuries. Um, so what do you do with zero? That doesn't mean the risk is zero with 440 people. So you put a confidence interval around it based on the number of athletes over the two years, so we're in four years. So we were able to say with 95% confidence that the risk is less than 0.9% at two years and 2% at four years. Now, athletes did receive shocks. They received shocks during competition, other physical activity. They received shocks at rest. They received, they received shocks for ventricular arrhythmias, supraventricular arrhythmias, and noise, as do any defibrillator patients. When you looked at the uh, individuals receiving shocks, we found that uh, there was no difference between people, the number of people who had received shocks during competition and those receiving shocks during physical activity. And competition included practice. Um, more received uh, shocks when active than when they were at rest overall. So we did not um, look at quality of life in this study, but we did look at what the athletes did after they had a shock. We know that ICD shocks are painful. They impact quality of life, and they're not something we would wish on any of our patients. We found that 51% had received a shock for one reason or another during sports, of whom seven stopped sports altogether, 13 stopped, stopped some. Most of these actually went back, and 12 had stopped sports for shocks received at other times. But I think what this tells you is these, these patients kind of voted with their feet. So we know that the shocks were painful, but on the other hand, they went back. Um, they chose to go back. And I think it's not surprising when you think about sports, you, you know, many people receive a painful injury during sports at some point in their life, and they often go back anyway. And I think that's what we found in this, in this study. So there were limitations, self-selected patients, obviously, as in any study, there was no control group. It was just a big series. Um, but in summary, shocks weren't rare, but there were no uh, significant health consequences in patients returned to sports. So these data did not support the blanket restriction that had been um, in place. And we were very pleased to see that in, uh, when, in the next iteration of the eligibility guidelines, um, sports participation became a class 2B. It went from the guidelines changed, which I'll talk about a little bit, went from yes and no to the class of uh, recommendation. But it now is something that may be considered. 
Um, and since that time, academic um, in the academic sphere, um, there's been a lot, some big changes. So uh, before that, basically, there were tons of debates in the literature and at meetings. Sh yes, no, should they be playing? Should they not be playing? No longer are we debating whether or not this should be happening. So more recent talks supporting sports for the pediatric population. This was at um, Heart Rhythm Society, uh, Major League Soccer Physician Conference, top three return to play considerations. And even more important than the academic sphere, in the world in general, here we see Christian Erickson has a cardiac arrest, he gets a tiny device, and now he's back playing soccer again. And so I think that really the, 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 the world has, has changed the way we think about this. So to talk a little bit now about the defibrillator patient going back. Um, so what were the top three return to play considerations? I'll get back to these two, just talk a little bit first about the device and programming. So um, in our study, we did not see a lot of lead malfunctions. This is, the, this is the rate of lead malfunction. We didn't have a control group, but this is kind of similar to what we uh, see in general. Um, we did look at whether there were specific, um, specific sports or other factors that contributed to lead problems um, in the athletes. There had been a lot of discussion of whether uh, sports that use your arm are gonna uh, worsen, um, worsen uh, lead uh, insulation breaks. Um, we didn't actually find that, but we did have um, uh, we didn't have a lot of swimmers uh, and rowers to really look adequately at that. The main uh, predictor was just um, if you had an advisory lead, you were more likely to have a fracture. Um, we did see that those who were in the very highest uh, uh, decile of um, of weightlifting did have a higher uh, lead fracture rate. So we um, did not include, uh, we, we did include sports like basketball and soccer that the American Academy of Pediatrics consider, cons, uh, considers to be contact sports, but we did not have a lot of really high uh, violent um, types of contact sports and whether lead survival would be different in those sports, uh, we, we don't know. Um, that's something I have to talk to the patient about. Um, all our ICDs were transvenous um, just because of the timing of the study. Um, so I think for some sports, there might be a theoretical uh, in, uh, benefit to um, a theoretical benefit to uh, subcutaneous, and again, to avoid that, that lead between the clavicle and the first rib. Um, on the other hand, uh, with sub-Q, the lead's outside the thorax. And so it seems to me if something hits you in the chest, you might be worse off with the subcutaneous. Um, there is a study ongoing out of uh, Israel that uh, is just getting started called the Sports SICD study um, that is very similar. I'm, I'm working with the, uh, the guy, Sammy Viskin, uh, who's the PI for this. It's very similar to our study, but for SICD. So if you have any patients, um, they, they can enroll uh, directly in this study. Um, we looked at programming. Uh, not surprisingly, those who um, were programmed with out-of-the-box programming were more likely to have shocks, both at appropriate and inappropriate, than those who were set with higher rate cutoffs and longer durations. We did not see any difference in syncope, um, so it's safe to set, your, uh, set the devices in this way to avoid shocks. So the ICD Sports Registry answered one question uh, about the safety of sports for individuals who have ICDs. But it really left open a much bigger question that put us in a very difficult position. So what about the athlete who has cardiac disease, but they're not felt to be clinically at high enough risk to need an ICD? So in particular, if you take HCM. So now we're in a situation where we're telling kids, if you have an ICD, you're OK to play. But if you don't have an ICD, now we're going to restrict you. And this is particularly true for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is continues to, to really say that um, if you have HCM, you should not be playing sports. Um, and so this was a very difficult situation because no one thinks we should be putting ICDs in to allow sports. Um, so in order to try to answer that question, we initiated, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before we get to that, basically there's uh, theoretical downsides to uh, sports participation for HCM. That you have outflow obstruction, maybe you're going to get ischemic, you're going to have the adaptive changes, it could be potentially deleterious. There's also potential benefits in HCM though. Uh, HCM improves, uh, I'm sorry, exercise improves diastolic function, improves endothelial function, all of things that are uh, detrimental in, in HCM. So uh, we know we can, we know how to risk assess in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We have standard risk factors. We have emerging factors from MRI. This was a study that looked at a uh, scar on MRI um, and found that um, basically uh, 
almost everyone that had a cardiac arrest either had a traditional risk factor or had scarring. There's a, there was still a very small residual risk of people that had absolutely no uh, risk of sudden death and people that had absolutely no markers of risk on uh, clinically or on MRI. Um, and so, and we have a calculator um, from Europe that kind of gives you, lets you plug in a bunch of variables and decide what the risk is in HCM. So does exercise increase that risk or not? Um, we really did not know. Um, again, we have a paradox of exercise in the general population and we don't really have any ideas. Things are gonna get better or worse with exercise in HCM. So to try to answer that question, we then launched um, a larger study that was called Exercise in Genetic Cardiovascular Disease. And we had an HCM arm that I'm gonna talk about most, but we also did have a long QT arm uh, to answer that question for that group as well. So the LIV study, we had LIV HCM and LIV long QT. Um, and, uh, the goal of these studies was to determine the incidence of arrhythmic events over three years um, and compare them between those who were exercising and those who were sedentary. And we were originally gonna thought we were gonna have to lump together moderate and vigorous and compare to sedentary, although in the end we were able to pull out the vigorous and then compare the quality of life. We enrolled patients from age eight to 60 with or without an ICD. And we enrolled patients at any level of exercise from sedentary to moderate to vigorous because this was gonna be a comparative study. Uh, we excluded uh, uh, conditions precluding exercise, such as those with severe heart failure or uh, individuals that uh, might be in a wheelchair, that type of thing. Um, and we uh, had other exclusion criteria. We recruited for this study, uh, both through 42 sites uh, that were worldwide. Um, and we also uh, allowed patients to self-enroll, which we had also done in the ICD sports registry. So patients could just hear about us and call us and we would uh, enroll them directly. For the self-enrolled, we had a uh, core labs to uh, confirm the diagnosis. We classified their, we uh, had them fill out very detailed questionnaires. Uh, they uh, classified their exercise. Um, we obtained clinical data and we surveyed them every six months for the endpoints. So these uh, data uh, were uh, shown at ACC and came out just a month ago. We enrolled 1600, for HCM, we enrolled 1,660 individuals who uh, completed the, fo uh, the follow-up. Um, 900 and some were males. Um, we ended up with about um, a third of them being vigorous exercisers defined as greater, uh, doing a sport that's greater than six Mets at least 60 hours a year, of whom 259 were doing that sport competitively. Um, uh, and uh, 709 were moderate and 252 were sedentary. So overall, um, basically the endpoints um, were reached in the two groups um, essentially identically. There was 4.6% events in the non-vigorous, 47 in the vigorous for uh, essentially, uh, uh, essentially uh, superimposed lines here. Um, when you look at the hazard ratio, it's 1.01 really about as close to equal as you can get. And when we um, did some uh, sub-analyses, we, uh, we took out the people who were genotype positive, phenotype negative, which we had allowed to enroll. They were just 8%. We found this uh, similar findings. Um, we uh, adjusted for any characteristics that were uh, different. We uh, took out the class twos. Really, whatever, however we looked at this data, uh, the hazard ratio uh, was approaching one. So uh, we were able to say that uh, Basically, uh, there was no increase in events with those exercising vigorously or even competitively. Now, we had a lot of questions about the you know, varsity athletes. So we also looked at the group age 14 to 22. We're going to do another publication on these, but these do appear in the supplement because we had so many you know, people were asking about them. So we had, um, four, uh, we had uh, amongst those age 14 to 22 who were phenotypically positive, we had 42 varsity athletes. We had 45 individuals doing vigorous sports at a non-competitive level. We had 91 non-vigorous uh, individuals. And basically these numbers are too small to do this type of statistical analysis, but the findings were almost uh, identical. In fact, the, the, the numbers were smaller in the vigorous exercisers. So in conclusion, in that prospective study of 1,660 individuals, um, those engaged in vigorous exercise did not experience a heightened risk of death arrest um, appropriate ICD shocks or arrhythmic syncope, um, including those who were participating in high intensity competitive sports and the overall event rates were low. Um, again, post hoc analysis limited to those with overt HCM showed a similar hazard ratio, although non inferiority was not demonstrated in those. With, we had set this up as a non inferiority uh, analysis. Um, but in no group was there, our subgroup was uh, either one of these two uh, activities, vigorous or non vigorous, shown to be superior.
And so these data also do not support universal restriction of vigorous exercise in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are uh, some other, uh, what time is it now? Is he checking? <laughs> Oh, there's a clock. Okay, thank you. So there are some uh, some other data that have also looked at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, this was our data from the ICD Sports Registry. Again, the patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy were not suffering any ill events. Were not particularly likely to have shocks during exercise. This is a study from uh, Italy that uh, followed 88 athletes um, who found that um, there was uh, uh, 61 of them had stopped exercise, 27 of them continued. And basically there were more events in those who stopped exercise. So this was a small study, but again, similar findings. This was a study um, from uh, Sanjay Sharma's group in England that looked at uh, retrospective review, again, 53 athletes um, who had non-obstructive HCM who had con continued to play and none of them had, uh, there was no uh, significant uh, increase in events in those who were playing. Um, let's skip this. Well, let's skip this part, actually. It doesn't want me to skip. There we go. So in 2020, based on some of these uh, smaller studies, um, the uh, uh, guidelines for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had given um, sports participation actually a 2B and vigorous exercise uh, had given them a 2B uh, recommendation, but notes the, had noted the importance in 2020 of acquiring some data here. And so uh, these are actually being rewritten. We'll see what, what uh, there's any changes and the eligibility guidelines are also gonna be uh, rewritten in the upcoming year or two. So what about long QT? Um, long QT, we have several retrospective studies of uh, long QT from different groups. Uh, one of the first of these was from the Mayo Clinic that described 130 long QT patients who are continuing sports. And basically, um, th these are all just sort of retrospective series. There was only one arrhythmia in that group. These were all people who, you know, all young people who were uh, treated um, by expert um, long QT physicians. And um, there was just one arrhythmia during sports um, in that group. And it was a, a young person that already knew they were uh, at risk with, and had an ICD. Similar findings here from CHOP, similar findings, uh, in, uh, there were similar findings again from Boston Children's. And in our study, um, among the long QT patients who had defibrillators, um, they actually were not particularly likely to be having uh, shocks during sports. Um, what about CPVT? Um, this is a, a, a somewhat different um, animal um, in that, um, in, uh, when you have CPVT, catecholamines obviously rev up the uh, rev up the arrhythmias, and there are some uh, reports in the literature of people getting inappropriate shocks and then going on to have the F and die uh, with CPVT. Um, so I think uh, we are appropriately um, uh, concerned about the CPVT patient. Um, we did have patients with CPVT in our study um, who, and they were a group who um, did have more frequent shocks with activity. And they were also a group that frequently had storms. Um, the other group that had storms in our, in our study was uh, those with idiopathic VF. And I think that these were likely people who had CPVT that was missed. There is one small series, again, from the Mayo of, um, six, of uh, 24, uh, 24 individuals, actually, who, who were athletes with CPVT who were seen at the Mayo. They're treated at the Mayo with beta blockers, flecainide, sympathetic denervation. 21 decide to continue to compete, and they did as well as the non-athletes. So when this study came out, um, in, you know, editorialists were cautiously optimistic. Um, this is something that you know I think is kind of a don't don't try this at home kind of a situation. So you know, this is one that I, I would send to the Mayo. I haven't had this yet. Um, so uh, change in the guidelines for ch channelopathies uh, going back to 2015, where sports, again, may be considered for the athlete with a previously symptomatic long QT, um, should be adequately treated with beta blockers, um, either ICD, sympathetic denervation as appropriate. Um, other precautions, obviously avoiding long QT drugs, stay hydrated. Um, they recommend carrying a personal AED. This is something that I think is, uh, you know, something to be discussed. And very important, establish an emergency action plan with your school or your team when you do have a kid with long QT that is playing. This is a study I just wanna mention that is uh, enrolling athletes, um, higher level athletes um, to look at outcomes. It's called the ORCA registry out of University of Washington um, that it is uh, looking at really high level um, 
college and professional athletes um, who are continuing to play with any sort of um, cardiac condition. And this is something, again, I'm, I'm involved with. I'm not the PI, but can, if you do have athletes really with any condition, can help uh, get them enrolled in this. So I want to talk uh, for the remaining time about how we use data that we have for the athlete who's diagnosed with cardiac disease. So there's been a lot of changes between in how we think about data uh, between, from 1985 and 2005 when we were first starting to talk about this to 2015 to now. So there's changes in how we think about data in general in cardiology and how we think about recommendations. Um, and so for the first time in 2015, the uh, exercise recommendations moved to the class of recommendation uh, system. So instead of saying, yes, no, you're in, you're out, they, the, there's a recognition of nuance here, that uh, the data are not always complete and that uh, individuals have a right to make up their mind. So when we think about considering, so we've said for a couple things, for ICDs, for maybe for HCM, we can consider allowing them to return to sports. Well, who's doing the considering? Is it us? Is it them? You know, who's, who's, who's really doing the considering? And I think this brings to the, uh, to the fore the importance of shared decision-making um, as we're thinking about return to play. So shared decision-making is something that is, uh, we're all very familiar with in many, um, many realms of cardiovascular care. Um, it was first used to, thought, to talk about um, return to play for athletes by Johnson and Ackerman in this study in 2012 where this was the study where they're really just talking about the outcomes. But one of the things I thought was very interesting is they described their shared decision-making, um, uh, uh, they described their shared decision-making process. And they note that 157 came in competing and 130 chose to continue. So this was not just Mayo saying, yeah, great, no, no problem, go ahead. They really were talking through this um, with the patients. Um, and this is a concept that, um, that patients should be participating in this decision uh, which is uh, the, the word shared decision making is trendy, but this is a concept that really has been around for a long time. In our study, we had 77 patients doing uh, very competitive sports at a time that this was uh, felt to be re completely restricted. So there was some conversation going on. Um, uh, this is Dr. Ben Levine, who's actually going to be talking to us in a couple of weeks about other things, um, writing about the, um, the individual assumption of risk. Um, and we uh, had written about this um, in circulation a few years ago um, about the importance of moving towards a shared decision-making model for this. Um, so, you know, when we think about the purpose of data, we're, it's really um, to inform the decision. Um, we, but in, this, in the 2015 guidelines, we're really talking a lot about ensuring adequate time for evaluation and counseling. Um, and we're talking about, uh, you know, there always be tolerance in the system for individual responsibility. So these types of concepts are really moving to the fore for uh, athletes um, as well. So we looked, um, this came out about a year ago, we looked with some uh, residents here at Yale at the experiences of athletes um, who had arrhythmogenic conditions, who had returned to play. And basically, um, we, these residents uh, did some interviews working with some qualitative um, experts. Um, where uh, they, they, they interviewed in, uh, individuals who had returned to play. These were either uh, young people in the ICD sports registry or uh, Mayo patients um, with other types of conditions. And really what they found was that there was a lot of barriers and it was a very um, chaotic sort of environment. So most of the, uh, they'd, all had to, um, they'd all had to see multiple physicians. Some of them had had to change schools to continue to play. Um, many of them had, um, uh, had to bring in lawyers. Um, so th they were having a very difficult time. And uh, this was even the ones who had returned to play. So we really weren't able to interview the ones who hadn't returned to play because we, you know, who hadn't been able to because we didn't have a way to find them. But in addition to the barriers they described, one of the most striking, um, uh, one of the most striking findings of this study in the qualitative part of things was the number of uh, both um, athletes and parents who used the phrase, they didn't care about me, they just wanted to cover their ass. And we heard that over and over again. And it had really um, was a very, uh, a lot of cynicism uh, around this whole, this whole uh, environment. So how do we uh, incorporate shared, de shared decision making as we're talking to the athlete and a family about returning to play? So the first thing you're gonna talk about is what is the data? What are the limits of the data? 
So for, to take the ICD sports as an example, we had 440 patients, we didn't have 400,000 patients. And so that, you know, that uh, colors how we look at the data. Am I typical of the athletes and who the data was uh, collected? And again, this is true for any study in any patient conversation. But so, you know, you, the with conversation with a soccer player is different than a conversation with a football player where you have to say, you know, we don't know whether contact sports will impact the device uh, performance. What did the experts say? Why did they say what they did? So I talk about the concept that uh, thinking about risk is hard and irrational. This person, um, Richard Thaler, actually won um, a Nobel Prize for the concept that people don't think very clearly about risk. I think this is something that as doctors, we all kind of know, you know, we all win the Nobel Prize, but um, he got it. So, and I think, that, you know, an example of this is um, driving deaths after 9-11. We all know that um, even after 9-11, it's, it's a lot more dangerous to get in a car than an airplane, um, but people were driving more and driving deaths increased. So I talk to families a lot about the spectrum of comfort with risk. It's very hard to put a number on the risk of a kid in front of you because everyone is different. So, but I think we can talk about how you think about risk. So talk about this girl. This uh, young woman, 16 years old, sailed around the world by herself. Now, I don't know how many people in this room would let their 16-year-old daughter sail around the world by themselves. This was obviously a family that had a high tolerance for risk. Um, on the other hand, um, what about American football? There's increasing um, data that American football has a lot of problems, and there's a lot of deaths every year with American football, but many people, but not all, let their kid play American football. And so I think you can kind of talk to a family, you know, would you let your kid climb Mount Everest? Would you let your kid play American football as a way of thinking about their own uh, risk tolerance? So this was an athlete who, um, in our very first year of screening, um, this was like the second day, we see this EKG that uh, is clearly showing a long QT. So we, this was our first year. So we had about a thousand conversations with every possible combination of stakeholders between ourselves at Yale Cardiology, the team physicians at Yale, the student health director, the athletic department, legal, as well as the student and their parents. And I did bring in, um, a, a, I did have this patient go to Mayo because I didn't feel like I could be like every, you know, the judge and the jury and the prosecutor and what have you. So I wanted an outside opinion. So we basically had every possible opinion. We finally did let the patient play, the student. Now we had a screened athlete again a couple of years later. And by that time we'd gone through this whole process. And that was like, we had two phone calls in a meeting and there was really nothing very different. So here at Yale, we have um, uh, what we now call our SDM protocol. Um, the team physician takes a central role. And basically there's a, a discussion with the athlete and the family between the that's the first thing that has to happen is your own conversation with the athlete and the family. Um, we then meet with the athlete, the family, the trainers, and the coach led by the team physician in a meeting that's all together where we discuss the condition, the precautions, the role of the teammates. We have a chance to answer the questions. It gives a chance for the parents and the kid to see that we're all on the same page. Um, and then we do, the legal department does have the, uh, both the, page, the student and the parents, regardless of the age, sign a hold harm, what they call a hold harmless document. And so uh, we now have a plan in place and we've done this about seven times in the past few uh, years. So future directions for me, we have live long QT, which uh, is also completed. We're actually in the process of analyzing this now. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's a big piece of our future direction, our current direction. Um, we have been enrolling the live patients in a uh, long-term follow-up. So we have live XT. We have our quality of life analyses still to look at. We have a number of sub-analyses. This is all in the, uh, the current uh, data set. Um, be looking at uh, the impact on the underlying cardiomyopathy. This is something I didn't talk about too much. I wasn't sure how I fit it all in, but um, this is something we do not look at in live, and it doesn't. It's important for things like arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which I didn't talk about, but is does have some different. Um, uh, implications uh, as far as long-term endurance exercise. So we'll be, um, the next step, we're hoping to uh, uh, expand LIV to look at other cardiomyopathies as well as other channelopathies. And so in summary, um, every decision around return to play should be a shared decision. And then by thanking uh, the team that has worked uh, with me throughout to evaluate these athletes. So a few minutes for questions. <laughs>
Okay. Any questions? We're going to make a, a brief set of remarks as to are thinking about their question. Uh, to make uh, Rachel feel a little embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, just, I wanted to read to you um, from the uh, from a letter that I wrote in support of, um, of her receiving this uh, 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 distinguished professorship. So I think it gives you a perspective of, of what it takes over a career and how she is an exemplar for all of us of the clinician investigator uh, who has made impact uh, um, not only at Yale, and everything she's done, but also across the world, as we've seen. Thank you. Um, I also just want to remind uh, something I don't think I've ever shared with you, but I first heard of this person, Rachel Lampert, um, around 2001 or so. And I don't know, the paper was very early in her career. I was also, as many others at the time, involved and in, interested in this concept of heart rate variability and what I could do with it and how could I maybe use it to risk stratify patients uh, who with advanced heart failure. I, a lot of it hasn't gone very far with heart variability, as we both know, but she wrote this amazing paper that I think was the first time I heard of her and the group here um, on heart rate variability at, in and around the time of September 11, which was very impactful. And I think um, uh, just kind of gives you a sense of how do you um, can uh, use the world around you and the events around you to study and understand uh, 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 biology. And I think, uh, just wanted to share that. So let me read from this, um, and then I'll maybe uh, we'll have a few moments for questions. And I'm not going to read all of it, but um, just to, um, to to say, Dr. Lampert has made seminal contributions to cardiovascular medicine, the field of cardiac physiology. Through her clinical investigation, she has explored the origins of mental stress-induced and emotional-triggered arrhythmogenesis, the role of the autonomic dysregulation in cardiovascular clinical syndromes, and the implementation of implantable devices on arrhythmia management. She has challenged dogma, as you heard here, and connected through an expanded mechanistic framework, disparate clinical presentations such as depression, sudden cardiac deaths, which are affecting the health of patients. During her academic career to date, um, while she has explored a broad range of themes related to arrhythmogenesis and its implication, she has also driven deeply into previously understudied areas. This has allowed her to make critical and unique insights into the social determinants of arrhythmia presentations and the role of non-traditional approaches to arrhythmia care. Fearlessly, Dr. Lampert has mastered multiple clinical research approaches in her work, including genotype-phenotype association studies, in vivo physiological monitoring and cardiac imaging approaches, large-scale cohort studies, and randomized clinical trials. Her research has received nearly continuous independent funding for the NHLBI foundational sources in industry since 2000. So very small snippet, but just to give everyone a perspective of uh, what a uh, what I think is roughly a 30 plus year career here <laughs> at Yale and the impact she's made. Uh, I was uh, interacting with Dr. Craig McPherson just a few days ago and uh, reminded of, of the work that you're, you've done with him even early in his career and Linda and Bob and Matt Berg and you know obviously many others in, in the room. So uh, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully we've given you a few moments for people to uh, think of any questions uh, to ask Rachel before we end. Yeah, oh, go ahead and then Jeff. Yeah, so, okay, so uh, I, I was going to ask about, so uh, I've had patients who have been looking at these human review statuses, these uh, last year after the uh, cardiac death for other conditions. How, how has this, um, you know, because you're especially seeing it in settings where the positive predictive value of a positive hypoxemia is zero by design. So how has that uh, how has that been uh, received by the, the individual who's doing this positive? And the and, and what are the challenges? Like how have you navigated that arc of screening those young individuals who have more positive uh, challenges? So right now, um, using just standard, you know, EKG interpretation techniques, which have been codified in, in the current uh, documents called the international criteria. The rate of false positives, in other words, where you have an abnormal EKG, you do a workup and you don't, you don't find anything, is about 4%. And that's what we find here at Yale and throughout is 4%. Some, some years it's less, some years it's, it's 
So, um, and then of that, uh, and then every year, I didn't really talk too much about our screening experience, but I would say every year we find something. We find a WPW, we find long QT, we find an HCM. So every year we find one or two things that uh, students that we are then treating, risk assessing, et cetera. Um, so what about the other three and a half percent that don't turn, or the other, I guess, 4% fall, po false positives that don't turn out to have anything? People have actually looked at this. So um, there was a, the, the University of Washington had a group in sports cardiology is very active, not, I'm sorry, in sports medicine is very active. And they actually did a survey where they asked athletes about how they felt about pre-screening, post-screening, and really they found that um, people, the athletes were okay with it. Even the ones who had had a false positive and gone through, um, gone through evaluation that, you know, didn't turn out to show anything, would recommend it to someone else. You know, that's how you ask that type of question. So um, I think that although there's concern that, oh, you know, we're holding people back, we're creating false anxiety or, anxi you know, unnecessary anxiety, um, in the end, they they were reassured. They felt good that um, you know that we cared about them. You know, I hear that sometimes. You know, from 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 kids and parents, and not so much from the kids themselves, but you know, from the, from the parents that you know, well, yeah, I know, but you know, I'm, I'm, it was really comforting to us that that you guys were taking such good care of our kid, even though we turned out to be fine. So, Jeff. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> Longer. <laughs> right. Thank you. So that's, yeah, so in general, there's a lot of controversy around screening because of, as you say, the, the cost. So I think, I'm, as you can see, I'm, I'm in favor of EKG screening. And so I haven't pushed for more because I think that there's, it's hard enough to kind of create the case for ECG screening as far as cost. When you actually look at cost effectiveness, when you think about, you have to do a lot of, you know, Markov type analyses to try to get the number of lives saved. But it's actually, if you look at year of life saved, it's pretty inexpensive because you, you're saving, you know, if you postulate you're saving, you know, 60, 80 years of someone's life. So, um, but I think that certainly it would improve the yield. We know that for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, the, uh, the ECG has an 80% sensitivity, so it's good, but it certainly isn't perfect. So you'd pick up that. Um, we know that um, coronary anomalies, um, whatever these series, like coronary anomalies is always number two, like whatever is number one, coronary anomalies number two, which we obviously don't generally see on, a, on an EKG. ECHO will pick up most of those. Um, we've been, you know, we've worked a lot with Bob and his team to really get um, even uh, our adult sonographers imaging the origins of the coronaries. And most of the time they are able to do it and it's really been great. Um, so I do think that, that it certainly would increase the yield. Again, it's just though gonna hit that much more resistance because of the cost, as you say. Just, yeah. I think the other thing that makes even POCUS harder is that like an, you can train pretty much anyone to do an EKG. You know, you, you can train a lay person to, to put on the EKG. So then you only need the person to interpret it, which is, you know, doesn't take as much time. But I don't know. I think even with POCUS, you're always going to have to train someone. You know, I mean, it, 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 I don't know. Can, can you train a layman to do POCUS, you think? Yes. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Oh, okay. So the AI will tell them to move two inches laterally. Oh, oh cool. Cool. <laughs> Arthur? Thank you. Well, well, so um, the, so for as of 2020, it's a two B vigorous or competitive. Um, I think you know we don't know if there's actually there the HCM guidelines are under uh, they're undergoing revision as we speak, and so I suspect vigorous will get um, upgraded. Whether competitive will get upgraded, I'm not sure. But um, I suspect that will be, um, you know, continuing to be a moving target. But no, nobody recommends putting in an ICD in order to play sports because ICDs have their own, um, you know, they have their own risks. And I think one of the things that Liv showed is that if you need an ICD, you should get one. And if you don't need an ICD, doing sport, there, there was no difference in those without ICDs between those who did sports and those who didn't. So I think that um, if you, you know, you can, you should just go with the clinical, you know, the clinical indications. Well, yeah. So, so yeah. So MR uh, is in the most, in the 2020 uh, guidelines, there are uh, the MR criteria for ICD. So definitely you should be getting an, uh, an MR. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, it's a school by school thing. So here at Yale, you know, I, we work for Yale, we're part of Yale. So we do it at Yale in, in um, collaboration with Yale University Health Services, which is a separate sort of entity from us. But we partner with the health plan um, to do it here. So each school chooses whether they want to do it or not in college. There's no high school, there's no mandates around anything in Connecticut. Um, so as far as schools, um, basically, I, you know, I work with this, uh, this foundation guy. And if there's a school that wants to do it, um, you know, we, we facilitate that for them and we do, you know, have a contract with that school. We've done it for a few schools so far. The only state um, that has a mandate for screening um, is Florida, which mandates screening, uh, ECG screening for high school athletes. And it's actually somewhat of a mess. So uh, I don't think anyone is actually in favor of that because basically there's so many false positives and people doing it that don't know what they're doing and kids being you know taken out of play for months at a time and it's not it it takes a lot of infrastructure to do ECG screening correctly and that's really one of the reasons why there's so much controversy about it because if you try to do it on a wide scale and you're not ready you're going to create a lot of problems. So you do have to do it in a way that is set up to be smooth. So one of the things that makes our program smooth, for example, is that I've worked with our, our pre-auth department. So we get that, you know, as soon as we have somebody that needs an echo, I contact pre-auth, they get the pre-authorization, I contact Bob's team with, you know, Ray uh, Amendola, and we, we, you know, we get the echo spot. So we, we have processes in place. But if you don't have those kind of processes in place, then it can, it can create a lot of uh, a lot of chaos. So I think um, the, the need for infrastructure is really kind of critical for ECG screening. So briefly, uh, thank you, Rachel. Wonderful. Thank you. Just a reminder that next week is Independence uh, Day. We will not have grand. The next two weeks, we have Dr. Uh, Lauren Sperling, um, who's an internationally acclaimed preventive cardiologist, and then followed by that, Dr. Ben Levine, who you saw reference, will talk to us um, as perhaps the mo one of the most prominent exercise physiologists in cardiovascular medicine. Um, and that will conclude our series for this uh, 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 academic year. And we'll take a break uh, from uh, July 19th through September 12th, and we'll, begin we'll restart on a new calendar. So thanks, everyone, and hope to see you uh, in these last two uh, grand rounds.